you grew up in China, you studied in the United States, now you're in France and in SEAD, um, you are a scientist by training. So you're a man of many worlds. Um, and now you are actually uh, teaching MBA students. Um, uh, you've worked in consulting, so you've seen quite a bit. So moving from um, uh, uh, sort of a scientist background into a strategy uh, world, how, 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 did, how did that happen? And, how did that happen? <laughs> what, what did it teach you really? Um, yeah, um, I think there, there are multiple reasons why it happened, but as I sort of post hoc think about it, uh, what drives me for all these moves or career transitions, as many would call it, um, it is, is actually what all of you are actually doing in, in Purpose Venture Capital. It, it's the chase for impact. Um, I really, at the very beginning, I was very interested in biology, the, the secret of life, the code of life, if you will. I was little, this little young boy who was going around and catching bugs and try to understand what's, what makes life, life. Um, and then with that passion, I went into research and I was very, very fortunate to get into Tsinghua in China and then got to see this world leading researchers from all over the world, really pushing the boundary of knowledge. And that at that time, I believe is where impact is generated. Uh, so I launched myself all the way into do, doing my own PhD in stem cell research, genetics, um, and developmental neurobiology, which was a fascinating and wonderful field. And I think we are still benefiting uh, from that field um, as we speak, um, like the latest CRISPR development, etc. But at one point during my PhD, I realized um, I really wanted to make that impact a little sooner or see that impact a little sooner. And that's when I uh, moved into Kellogg. Actually, on a personal note, thanks to my, my dear wife, Lee, who you have met as well. Um, and, and we basically started to say, how do we translate the knowledge creation into the real world impact? And with that, um, I was once again fortunate to join Bain. Uh, I really worked with uh, large pharmaceutical companies through their early transition from classic pharma to biologics to cancer research. Um, and then I, I basically look at all of these and say, how can I even broaden uh, my impact and bridge to both worlds? And that's when I moved to, uh, to Fontainebleau to INSEAD because the wide platform exposure through INSEAD, I got to work with really great leading um, companies in the world across different sectors and get to uh, pollute the young minds, if you will, <laughs> the MBAs at an early age to really challenge them thinking, what is the purpose of business? What are we doing here? So yeah, I, I can't say these are all perfectly planned, um, but I think the gut feeling is really trying to find what are the impact you can generate uh, through either research or a real world business or um, other means. The, 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 so the, the impact and purpose is always there. And I think it's sort of uh, this late motif in, in a lot of uh, the work that we do. Um, and, and I think one area that you are very, um, you're trained in, which is uh, biology and, uh, and, and biological sciences, um, it's an area where uh, impact is, has, a, has a huge uh, component to it. Um, and you are working with pharma companies and you have also worked in the past with pharma companies. Just starting from there, how do you, how does, how is it different right now, perspective a few years ago or when you started your own career? Yeah. Um, so I think pharma is one of the window into the broader theme around how has technology changed who we are and how do we think about a business, right? If you think about pharma in the very early ages, uh, it's a lot about organic chemistry or, or sort of, you know, like organic chemistry, compound synthesis, et cetera. Um, it, it's pretty much a, a chemical company. But when we move into cancer biology, a few things happen. One is we realize the disease is more complex and maybe personalized. We've got to understand the person instead of just treating uh, a common certain type of bacteria or virus. 
Uh, therefore, there's a fundamental shift on who we are as pharma company, and many of them shifted from this classic blockbuster view um, of the drugs to a more refined, personalized way of tr treating medicine. At that time, I think it's also started with this really, we talk about this tension um, of the outside worldview of pharma versus inside view of the pharma. I've worked with a lot of pharmaceutical companies, uh, large and small. The people who are in that industry really feel the pain and the purpose, uh, the pain of the patients and the purpose of what they do. But there is an inherent challenge about a pharmaceutical business model, especially when you look at um, R and D on, on, on oncology drugs. The, the expense is very high, right? And then now the world is actually benefiting a lot from the high price, although we condemn upon the high price of pharmaceuticals in the US, but we do benefit um, as a result of, of reinvestment into research. So a lot of what pharma are thinking right now is how do we actually rethink about that business model? If we are the R&D company, how do we make it more sustainable from a financial standpoint? But beyond that is getting also very interesting with this attention to social impact, to really benefiting the patient and the people. It's not treating the disease, but treating the people. There's a more fundamental change around how we think about pharma. It's not about a pill, a, a vaccine, treating a disease, but how do we look at patient journey in general? How do we improve the quality of life, not just eliminating the disease? I think that is where the field is moving to a more cross cross company within the eco industry and cross industry sectors within the ecosystem. And give you two examples on other technologies, right? One we talk a lot about is the 2007 iPhone. <laughs> when that comes along at that time, it's fundamentally changed on the consumer side, but later on, because of the connected technologies, it started to change how we think about health. Right? Basically now the boundary between healthcare industry versus health um, in general and consumer goods are being blurred. And therefore, how can, uh, I've worked with a lot of insurance companies uh, with, um, let's say, e-commerce company to really rethink about what do we do when we think health beyond pharmaceutical, uh, beyond healthcare services in general, and how do we think about data? And how do we think about who's responsible for the health? Is it healthcare professional led or is it patient led? So just a few examples on the evolution. I think sure. it's really broadened up and connecting across different sectors. And that's where most of the executive I work with uh, are really uh, thinking a lot about. And, and moving into that space, for example, the, the, the impact space and, and, yeah. and specifically on the ESG part, um, and you do work with a lot of established mature companies that have good intentions to move and, and measure uh, ESG or put in projects and initiatives around the ESG, but they're, they're struggling. And the latest work that you've done with Cargill, I think, uh, and an article that you've published, um, sort of shows the struggle that a lot of these companies have in moving into the ESG. Well, tell us a little bit about the, the, the Cargill project, how you got involved, the background, and, and then from there we'll, we'll dive into the ESG component. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that question. It is really true. Uh, your, your statement of the, the current state is many companies are, are all thinking about it, right? And then you see this flurry of different uh, um, uh, commitment after COP25 uh, that coming up. And, and I think that is on top of the senior leader's mind. Uh, let me sidetrack a little bit uh, to talk a little bit about that before I go into this wonderful project I've done with Truxmore uh, from Cargill. And actually we have been working with Cargill for the past five years um, on, on, on this and, and sort of beyond how do you transform the business. But the sidetrack is, is it's very interesting to see where the pressure comes for ESG. Um, so very early on, the pressure comes from the consumer, especially the advocacy groups, right? Basically saying, we really need to pay attention to this. And that goes into advocacy investors and stakeholders uh, adding pressure to the companies. But those, if you think about those as sort of start of the revolution, a little bit of a, a, of a poking the system, now it's become a lot broader because it's not the pressure only from outside, but when the new generations enter the workforce, Right? They basically re-ask 
not only what I participate in the broader contribution of the business, but what is my impact within that company. And increasingly that voice get louder and louder. So that puts both internal and external pressure on senior leaders to rethink about what takes you here as a successful business may not take you forward, right? That is from different angles, but ESG is certainly an additional angle on top of that. But funny thing is, and it's really interesting for all of us to think about what triggers action for senior leaders is often not those two pressures because they learned how to deal with those pressures. Sure. What triggers the movement is when their daughter and son Ask them, what do you do at work? If your daughter asks you, do you have maternity leaves? And you, re or your mother, I've, I've talked to a senior exactly. He said, my mother asked me the other day, what do you do? I cannot look straight in her eyes because that's the woman who burst me to tell her I did not have a maternity leave policy globally, right? So he turned around and implemented. So we, what we're basically saying, well, the reason I tell that story is I want, to deliver a first message, strategy is not about analysis and the brain alone. You need analysis to figure out what to do, which I'll talk about in a minute, but you need the emotions, you need the personal connections and convictions to move this forward. And that's what I really wanted to see why you were doing this for yourself, for the people around you. It may sound selfish, but that will give you this passion and drive to move this forward. And luckily that's what we've seen in a lot of leaders like Truk, my co-author who I work with, uh, like uh, Loic, um, uh, who is the president of Royal Canada. I can give you a list of names, yourself uh, included. It's really when we talk about these, our eyes light up and, and we, wanted, we wanted to make this happen, right? So now, now let, let me talk a little bit about uh, um, a cargo and do stop me and, and ask other questions as well sure. um, as we go along. So, so this started as a really fundamental challenge overall in ESG. So they, they, cargo wanted, because of their large global footprint, they wanted to make a commitment around water conservation. But the challenge is when Truk and the team work with the science-based uh, a target setting methodology, they quickly realized for the scale of Cargill, right? To do side-by-side -side detailed, right? Studies on, on, on water uh, impact, it will take about 15 to 20 years and about 15 million before we can actually start to think about what's the strategy. <laughs> By that time, I think the doomsday clock is already gone, right? So the, the challenge is really, how do we make a meaningful commitment but more importantly, started the action right now. So most of my research is not coming up with a smart strategy. That is a given. But what I care about is how do I get company to start early and start act upon things almost immediately to generate that impact. And just long story short, what they have realized, well, what we develop a, a framework together is to say, can we prioritize? Again, I will get criticism on this. <laughs> we're not saying you only do the most important thing, but we're starting to say, but, but what I'm trying to say is prioritize in order to start at the most impactful place, but you need to go everywhere, right? So, so the part is, it's a framework really looking at three angles. There's tremendous amount of data produced by not-for-profit, in this case, the Water Resource Index um, and others, to look at where are the most scarce resource and most impact of water pollution or water consumption is in the world, right? They have a global map around it. If you overlay that first element with the second part is where is, so, so that's the severity, and then overlay that with the amount of impact your company and business is generating, and then overlay what's your role of your impact within the industry. You can think about a penetration, market share, et cetera. And then you quickly realize there are four major angles. And when there's all the three overlap with their severity in, in water resource, you have a large impact and you have a large market share. That's where you need to start act yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> because so it's that's... like an equation in a sense. Exactly. You know, a perfect equation where you need to actually move in first. Absolutely. And for the other three areas it detailed in, in, the, in our article, you got to think about your role in relative terms. For example, if there's 
significant amount of severity and you have impact, but you have a low market share. That means you should act, but there is another player that can generate even bigger impact. Therefore, you need to start from this position to orchestrate a, a community and help really move the in industry in general forward through either a, a benchmarking standard setting uh, through really operationalize uh, these actions. So, so this is really thinking at a strategic level. Where can we start and eventually create a path to penetrate all of it? But don't stop at doing all the analysis before you can actually generate a very accurate number. By that time, it will be too late. Well, there is a question from one of our uh, actual listeners, and and they, they're at, uh, Roger is asking, you know, how do you get Hi, the, the company, uh, the ball running in the sense of how do you make sure that there's a buy-in around uh, this this um, ESG initiatives? Uh, is there is there some some type of a strategic, let's say, <laughs> approach to garnering uh, buy-in according to you? Uh, there is, and um, interestingly, that taps not into the strategy side, but the strategy execution or the organizational design side. So let me speak to a few things um, on top of my head and see if that resonates. Number one um, is you got to start listening. This is not a corporate initiative pushed uh, downwards. There should be something you listen to the community, you listen to internal employees and find where are the needs. I can give you an example. We have a visiting scholar here in our Africa initiative called Litinarte. We co-teach the MBA class. And she said this wonderful example. They have a mining company in Africa. And then they have this village that right next to the mine, they really want to do something to uplift the village. The village. They said, how about this? Given that they are so resource poor, we can give them a school or we can give them um, a, a hospital or we, we can give them a whole set of things. But then all of a sudden, as they're debating internally, someone stood up and said, how about we ask them what they want? So they actually went and asked the community. The community said, oh, we want a marching band. And everyone said, what? You want a marching band? <laughs> but the, the truth of the story is, because the marching band engaged with the youth after school on community contribution, on uh, after school education. So that's where they feel the spirit of the village, right? So they're not going to the next door village be because they have a marching band. So they use that an entry point to also show the community, we want to work with you and respect who you want to be. Eventually they did build a school, eventually they did build a hospital, but the pieces listen internally carefully and externally, coming back to my earlier point, find that passion and emotion to move everyone around. So that's one. And now I'm going to come to a little bit of cold-hearted structure. <laughs> uh, we have seen so many additional initiatives put by this figurehead on top. The first one is chief digital officer. Now we're moving into the chief sustainability officer. Chief sustainability officer will not solve your problem. Because most of the chief sustainability officer I've seen owns a team of five that produce okay. a sustainability report. Report is not action. And they have a tremendously difficult job to sit on the side and convince the business to give them the numbers while the business are really not sure what the numbers mean. Therefore, that goes to the second point is you can and you should put this position in as a signal internally and externally. But it should be part of your agenda. It should be part of the KPIs within the business performance. On what, is, what have you done to your sustainability initiative? Not just deliver your number and try to report initiative actions. Those are two different things. It's structurally integrating sustainability as part of the KPIs. And the third piece, I know the CEOs will hate me forever. This <laughs> need to be a CEO felt initiative because it is the fundamental to what business do. And I can give you a, a, another sort of little story. We have a beautiful, beautiful brick road in Fontainebleau called Hudu Supply. Mm -hmm. And there you have basically those beautiful mom and pop shops that you never know how they work in this modern society because their price is high, they don't have a large scale, 
they work with the local community, which the cost is also high, right? So that's another sustainability challenge is consumer demand for it, but they may not pay higher for it. But when I go there and talk to the fish vendors and talk to the, to the, to the uh, boulanger owners, you realize how do they make it work? Why do I come back to them to pay a higher price? So I would go buy langoustin, for example. I would buy five of them, right? And then they will always give you a six because they worried if one of them is not fresh, you won't have enough to serve the guests. Oh, I love that. And that is the way of thinking people and community more than the business performance. And the business performance comes in the longer term, right? Uh, Louis Ponsonet, who's the, the, the president of, of Royal Canon, uh, a Mars brand, he talked to me, he said, I worked so hard on who Royal Canon is. We keep our high premium price, but we really work with the formulation, the science, and the pet owners, the breeders, to make sure the animals are healthy. And people, as a result, are happy, the pet owners. And that will not give me an immediate return because our price is higher. If you go to the website, you won't buy a Royal Canon, you'll buy another pet brand. But if you love your pet, if you really want it to take care of yourself and the family, you will find us and we will give you, and that return comes longer term. That, that, that's, a, that's a great story. I mean, if, for example, it actually ties in with one of the questions that's also coming from a, a Kibria. And, and, and he says, uh, well, ESG is a very sort of cold, cold world. No, it's, uh, it's, it's created by the finance people. Um, it signifies an asset class of some sort. Uh, and and it, what you're saying is that it actually the human factor, uh, the real sustainability and impact is, is hidden in that human factor, the, 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 the way uh, a small shop owner gives you an extra uh, product because you know, they're worried that you might one of exactly we have dehumanized right yeah. so a lot of what yeah. we've been doing is a manufacturing age philosophy of dehumanizing human need to be managed but now really what we see now what i'm advocating even for strategy is people need to be empowered to think strategy right because the, you can't determine a strategy and expect a company to run for five years because no one knows the answer five years later and therefore, what you need to do is you harness this. The, that's where the G comes in. You become a governor. You point, you, you chart a mission and a vision for the company. And you empower, you enable people right, to, to make it happen. Boric, who is the head of international for Roche, a wonderful guy. He basically turned his entire globe into more of an agile circle-based organization. And he made the decision right down to each region so they can decide what's the most impact they can generate in market in terms of market success, patient awareness, et cetera, uh, through, through Roche's uh, products, right? So that's a fundamental different way to think about corporate control versus empowering everyone to do this. Well, one of the practitioners that I had worked with, he, he had said, do you really want to generate impact? Just shut up and listen first. Yeah. Um, um, it is very uh, hard. <laughs> Listen with your heart. Hard as it's well. very hard. It's very hard to actually put put yourself in that uh, you know humble position and and not say this is what the community needs, but actually listening to them and saying how do we make this work out and how what, what it would look like. So so I, what I'm getting from the sort of the gist of the conversation is that there's a humanizing element in in impact that it, it cannot be just written off as a sort of a financial asset class or as ESG and all that. And, and you are suggesting start from, you know, your community, listen to them, build up data, build up a lot of facts, where can you generate more impact and then, and slowly move into the area of uh, implementing that. Um, a lot of firms are struggling though. Um, yes. um, so, so how do you see that struggle? What, what would it lead to? Uh, because, you know, we need action. We need a lot of, um, especially on the climate part, very little time left. Um, yeah. where would, how would you manage that scaling up of um, actionable, um, um, strategy? Absolutely. So, um, 
this is sort of very case by case because each sector is has seen different challenges. For example, if you look at retail, what we basically seen is this rise of e-commerce omni-channel, but it's at sometimes at a cost um, of both margin, profit margin, and also the environmental damage. Because if you're now doing all the last mile delivery, then it has a huge energy, uh, human capital, and also um, uh, sort of environmental uh, consequence to it that we haven't factored in. So the answer to that, to me, very broadly, my apologies, but, but we can, if you're interested, do follow up on different uh, industry. But broadly, the way to look at this is I would draw an analogy from the digital transformation we all know. We cannot do patchwork to fix our old IT system. Because when you implement it three years later, it becomes obsolete again. Um, this is a very difficult time for a lot of the organizations because of COVID, because of business model change, because of digitalization. But to me, in all the chaos, what senior leaders, especially the board and C-suite should sit down also. If you empower people, they will contain the business. And then what you need is to carve time and think about where is the future of the company if we were to start with a blank page and understand who we are as a business, how would we reconfigure? For example, right, Toyota Women's City is rethinking about mobility. A lot of the mobility challenge we have right now with ride sharing even is how we configure the city structure. We have downtown buildings and then suburb livings. That means the commute, the, the commute is one way high peak time, right? And that's why simply saying remote work and others won't solve the problem. So they started to rethink, how do we redesign the city? So that's an analogy for us to say, hey, if we get our view, five years later, what will be a sustainable business in our industry? And what do we as a company stand for? And as a result, you can backtrack on where do you need to start right now? And that's where a lot of companies started thinking about uh, their IT infrastructure. Right? How do you think about you become an omni-channel company five years from now? It's not fixing my old operations or adding another e-commerce channel, but rather take that as a guidepost and then start to say, where do I need to start act right now? Right? And that's the way I would think about it. Uh, if I were to give one cautionary uh, tale, I know I'm being very adamant, <laughs> adamant about, about doing this. There are three Ps. There's profit people, and planet. You cannot forget the profit. Because if you forget a profit, you won't be the CEO to carry out the other two. So the part is, how do you manage this complexity? Right? Uh, Fitzgerald basically said, um, the first grade intelligence is being able to uphold this complexity, and at times even contradictions, and yet continue to be able to act to take actions and function. And that's what C-suite is increasingly to do. We call it ambidexterity, we call it balancing act. But the part is how do you keep performing at the same time, shaping the business into the future you want it to be and that you can look into your daughter's and son's eyes and say, I made this world a better place for you. And that's what we wanted to see. The, 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 I mean, just to sort of, I mean, we can talk about this for another 10 hours. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, there's so many things, yeah. so many different angles to, to dive into. But just a last um, sort of comment before we, we close our, you know, fast and furious spark session. <laughs> is, is, uh, where do we, um, when we look at especially you do mentor start startups and you see a lot of MBA students uh, and you work with them, they generate ideas, they do a lot of um, thinking about how to tackle social problems and environmental problems and how to invent um, new ways of uh, actually um, solving these problems. Um, what is one suggestion that you give to them um, um, in, in terms of the balancing act? How, do, how, how is it that they're going to be establishing a business and at the same time thinking on a sort of a broader perspective to generate impact? Well, is there, is there, is there one? Is there one like thing that? that I can say? That's a, that's a great question and you put me on the spot. Um, this is what I told my student 
Um, and I think it's important also for the investment community. And I think we all feel it now. There's a lot of excess capital dry powders here and there. It's not, uh, we need to rethink about this financial capital centered approach. And that means even more importantly for the financial community to think about where do we put our money, right? Now, flip, on, uh, flip side for executive startups, et cetera, um, I keep telling my student, cut through the clouds, cut through this halo of the topical things people all talk about and try to understand what's the fundamental challenge and problem. It's not the big C2C app that's gonna make money. It's the deepest problem in the supply chain, maybe even hidden. That is where the world needs attention and where money should be allocated and where the problem should be solved. And I think if you, we pay attention more to the depth of the problem, it'll be better than to say, what's the scalability and how much we can take this to everyone in around the world, right? So focusing on the problem, listening to both internal and external and find the gut, right? Find the courage and the compassion uh, within all of us. Don't wait until midlife crisis to realize this, right? Start finding that, early and that will make your life a lot happier. It doesn't make it easier, but it'll make your life a lot happier and make the people work for you feel a lot more meaningful of what they do. So that will be the one, find, find the problem, find a meaningful problem to solve. Wonderful. Jengi, thank you so much. I know that you've been very busy teaching and with client work and all that. So I really appreciate this half an hour with you and hopefully we'll keep up with the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank session. you so much for having me and keep up the good work uh, with Purpose Ventures and all the great uh, startups and, and, and the investors you're working with. Thank you very much. Yes. Ciao.